Okay, everybody, we're coming back in here. So if you're out in the lobby, come on back. <laughs> Migrate back this way. And uh, let me encourage everybody as we're kind of waiting for everybody to come in, maybe move up a little closer. You guys are doing everything you don't like people in your church to do, which is to grab the back rows and leave you on the front. So come up along uh, closer in the front. And uh, at the end of this session, we're going to do a drawing. Actually, we've already done a drawing. We already know the answer, but we're not going to tell you till the end and uh, give away the iPad uh, for those of you who were in the registration drawing. So uh, I've already got mine. Uh, I put my name into the drawing 300 times. So out of 1,000 people, I think my odds are pretty good. So but we're going to have to wait to see the reveal. Uh, very glad to uh, have Dave Ferguson with us. Thank you so much Thank you. for uh, taking time out and coming to Grand Rapids to join us here at our Relentless Conference. And uh, I thought that this would be a good, good time to ask some pretty nuts and bolts question about how some of the things that you were talking about kind of play out in a local church context. And also for us, as a family of churches, uh, uh, kind of a, uh, a young adolescent movement that's becoming uh, a catalytic movement of church yeah. plants. Uh, really to learn from you and your experience both at community and then new thing. And uh, you talked a little bit about this morning how you dreamed of planting the church all throughout the Chicago land. Talk to us how, how it went from, you know, the one site to multiple sites to a church of thousands that then moved into uh, a network of churches in church planning. Now, where did that dream come from? Was it an extension of what began on the napkin and, and how has that played out? Maybe give them a little sense of what New Thing is doing right now. Sure. Um, probably the best way to back up is, um, I mean, again, I, I, was, I was 25, my brother John was 23, Darren was 21, Scott was 27. We were, we were I mean, way, way, way young. We had, you know, had no money, had, had no buildings, had no people, had no sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, the one thing that we all did have, though, I think, our hearts really beat fast for this, the mission. We, we, the way we talk about it, helping people find their way back to God. And uh, before, we ever, before we were launched, remember we, we all got together uh, for breakfast and we were kind of mapping out this thing. And I'm gonna use this whiteboard, kind of help people make sense of this. We, um, we kind of like did, we kind of asked the question, what do we want this church to become? Yeah. And so, and so you guys, I mean you guys, a lot of you are there, so you can, you can relate to this. And it was actually, I don't even know, are there, are there hen house restaurants even around anymore? Hen House? Hen House. We certainly don't eat there, okay? But anyway, this was at a Hen House restaurant. <laughs> right. So the food was not good, right. but the discussion Denny's. was. Yeah. And we kind of laid this out. We said, okay, if we could do anything, we would love to. We talked about it this way. We said, we talked about it in three phases. Phase one, we wanted to become an impact church. And I'll kind of unpack these. We said, then phase two, we wanted to become a reproducing church. And then we said, phase three, We'd love to, we, if, if God would bless it, we'd love to see a movement. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, well, when we talked about impact, what we really meant by impact is we would love to be the kind of church that when we moved to the neighborhood, that if, that, that if we were ever taken out of the neighborhood, hmm. that the neighborhood would say, no, we have to have that church. Right. And, that, and then we said phase two, and I think because my dad was a church planner, so we kind of grew up in church planning, we were like, no, no, we gotta, we gotta be planting other churches. So that was kind of a deal. So we wanted to be a reproducing church. I don't know where this one came from. And in fact, sometimes we'd only talk about the first two because this one seemed, it, I mean, it's kind of arrogant, almost audacious, like a movement. Who do you think right. you are? Um, but we still wrote it down. And the braver we got, the more we'd talk about it, not just pray about it. And so we said, this was kind of our threefold vision. And we just, and really for the last 20 some years, I mean, we've kind of been marching exactly through this. And really at the point in time, then we went, I can kind of give the story multi-site. And then we kind of went to, you know, then became what was new thing. This, this story here, multi-site, is this what you want? Yeah. Okay, yeah. We, we went multi-site. We, uh, there, were, um, there, there were, there were two guys, well, this, this is all back up a little bit. There, there, we, went, we went door to door, actually. We went door to door just talking to people early on. Perfect. And, and one of the people that actually, we actually knocked on the door was the home of a guy named Nick Ryan. I, I'm telling you, if you're out there planting a church, don't underestimate. I'm telling you, God's at work doing stuff that may, um, may yeah. uh, produce fruit 10 years from now. Yeah. 
And so anyway, so Nick Ryan opens the door. Him and his fam, young family, they come to our first like Christmas preview service, uh, but they're not really involved. He's this real estate developer. I don't really know him, but I like him because he's an outgoing guy. Right. Well, it turns out his partner, a guy named Bruno, Bruno is a guy who's going through tough stuff in his own marriage. He comes to Nick, say, man, what do I do? I don't know. He recommends a counselor to him. Nick, Bruno goes sees this, this counselor who's not a Christian because I mean, they're not going to our church. And he says, well, maybe you will get some kind of spirituality in your life. So Nick's coming to our church some, and so Bruno decides to join him. And so they both start coming. Just He's trying to pull his life together. Well, they get involved in my small group. They both find their way back to God. They become Christ followers. I get to baptize them and their wives. It's an awesome thing. Mm. I'll never forget, too, it, Bruno's wife, Judy, is in, the, is in the small group. We're going through um, the Gospel of John, and we got to the part about Nicodemus, and she's reading, born again. Oh, yeah. Born again. And then she goes, I think that's what's happening to me. Mm. And uh, so we got to see them all become Christians. But the key moment for us in multi-site, though, was when those two guys, they said, hey, this experience of community that we're having in this group here, how can we get that in the properties that we're starting across the Midwest? Wow. And they had 26 properties across the Midwest. And again, they had no church background. So, and, and quite frankly, they saw it. Um, they saw churches, okay, this is a smart business guy, they saw churches as a huge source of social capital. Yeah. yeah sure. Who does a better job at creating community, creating belonging, creating, than churches? And he's like, if I get this kind of church in my neighborhood where my apartments are, this is his thinking, wow. they will stay there longer. If they stay longer in that apartment community, it increases my retention rate, <laughs> which means more money for me. Smart business plan. Right, but he's, yeah. but, and it was both. He was like, hey, I would love to help out the church, but this is also yeah. going to be a good thing for... And so he came to me and said, hey, what if, um, and we were still meeting in high school, what if we just moved, the whole high, moved, moved everything down to this new development I'm doing? And I was, it was like two towns away. Mm -hmm. We were about 700 people in high school. And I was like, I don't know if we can move everybody that far. And right. then we're both of us, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's him because he had 26 properties or me because I'm a church planner. We're like, well, what, if yeah. we just, what if we just did a second one? And so they actually built a community center um, you know, about a three and a half million dollar community center with focus groups from our church. Mm. And then we started a separate not-for-profit called the Institute for Community. You can check it out if you want, which is basically kind of like a YMCA with a, an intentional spiritual component, which encouraged people to be a part of our church. Wow. And so that's, that was really how we ended up going multi-site. And that was before, you know, back in the day before anybody really started doing it. And, um, and, and it was just a total God thing. I, I, you mean to go to the new thing part? Yeah. Draw, yeah. Okay, so then. Talk about new things. So that, was, so that was how we ended up going multi. So now we have 14 different locations. Um, and, uh, with, how many people total in the 14 locations? There's probably six to 7,000. Okay. I mean, in attendance. Right. Um, with new thing, we, um, we'd, we'd, we'd gone to a few different sites, now probably two or three sites. We have probably three sites. And. Um, I was bragging about how nobody ever leaves our staff. Everybody loves community. How would you ever, you know, nobody ever leave. And, of course, the next right. week, my youth pastor comes to me, and he says, man, I've been, I've been thinking about planting a church. Now, keep yeah. in mind, I mean, this is only 11 years ago or something, yeah. and we, we never planted a church. You guys should be booing me right now. Boo. Right. And, uh, and so he comes to me, and he says, um, I, think, I think about planting a church. I'm like, well, where? And he says, well, uh, Denver. Of course, it's Denver, Southern right. California, always, right? Right, right. <laughs> or and Kalamazoo. Not yeah. so much. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but that's good for you, I guess. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Got your own niche there. Market share. <laughs> right. Um, so basically then at that point I said, well, I'll tell you what, go out to Denver, go on out there, see what happens, and then we'll come, come back and we'll talk. And he came back, and he was gone less than a week, like five days, came back. He'd already made a couple connections, and in that time frame, raised $100,000. Wow. And so it was clear that God was doing something. And so that was the moment for us. And this was a really important moment for us. We said, okay, if God's blessing this, then we got to get behind it. Hmm. And so we got Dave up on the stage in one of our leadership communities and said, hey, Dave and Heather, we said, listen, they're going to Denver. They're going to start this church. We're going to give them money. And if Dave and Heather are going, some of you, all the people at community, you need to go with them. Hmm. You need to move with them. Now, it's, it's funny what people do when you tell them to or ask them. <laughs> right. And we had about 35 people that uh, sold their homes, quit jobs, transferred schools, and left Chicago, moved out to Denver to start this brand new church. And, um, and, the, and so we just stayed in relationship. 
between the two churches. And then pretty soon we started another, that worked so well, so then we, pretty soon we started another church in New York and then Boston and then Knoxville and some other places. And we just kind of stayed in relationship. And pretty soon we just named it. And right. We called it New Thing. And, um, and so I could tell you more about that. But How many churches are in the network of, of New Thing? There's probably about 160, 160 churches that are part of New Thing right now. Um, with more, and more and more kind of international too, which is kind of fun. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, so I planted my church in 1996. What year did you plant uh, community? Uh, 89. Okay, when, I don't know about you, but when I planted, we didn't have much as far as like models. We talked about this at breakfast. There wasn't like a lot of agencies or organizations saying, here's how to do it. Uh, Pastor Dwayne just said, Lee, you can do it. And if it, doesn't, <laughs> and if it doesn't work, in six months, you'll be back. And okay, well, so at least, that had, was, at least you had a backup. That was my backup. <laughs> So that That's was so our bad. church planning model. He said, you can have our name if it helps, and God bless you. <laughs> and uh, so I don't know. If, yeah, you, a little bit. You gave a whole lot of love. <laughs> um, but it seems like there's like an emergence yeah. of church planning emphasis and movements. Uh, ARC is a, a well-known one, Stadia, New Thing, uh, and Church Multiplication Network. Yep. Uh, it just seems like in the last decade, that's kind of come up, which is uh, of such a benefit to so many church planners. And, you know, RLCI is, is a family of churches now kind of getting the snowball rolling as far as planning churches. I, I'm interested to hear your take on why uh, or what your perspective is on why that's beginning to emerge and uh, what's kind of going on with that. I mean, if, if you had to put your finger on it, and I know it's kind of a it's a big thing to say, I think this is what God's doing, but yeah. what do you think God's doing and why is that significant and important kind of in the American context? Um, I mean, my, my hunch is, I mean, I, got a, I think there's, there's kind of a, um, a number of intersecting factors that are happening. I think on the one hand, I think we've seen a decline in mainline denominations. That's not a big secret I'm letting out here, is there? All right. All right, so I think the, the decline in, in mainline denominations and denominations as a whole, and denominations primarily are kind of built around affinity. A lot of them have an ethnic affinity, at least historically, and also theology. And so in some ways they're not really built for mission. Mm. And I think one of the things, and it's true about, about, about this group, and I think it's true about the other groups you, you named, I think the increase in the network is one of the coalescing principles, one of the organizing principles, one of the things that draws them together is mission. Mm. That's, that's why you're here, because you guys want to plant churches. You want to you you implant life-giving, spirit-empowered churches. Right. That's what draws, draws you together. And I think, like if you go with ARC, I would say ARC is, I mean, um, they would they'd talk about life-giving churches, and then, but they'd also talk about mission. If you talk about Acts 29, sure, they have a real strong bent towards reform theology, but it's also secondarily probably about mission. If you're talking about new thing, um, I mean, we have people from all different kind of denominational backgrounds, and it's almost exclusively mission and then about reproducing. And I think that's, that's, I think that's really key. And I think along, so you have the decline of the denominations and then, the, then these more mission-focused networks, which I think are then attractive to uh, young apostolic kind of leaders. Hmm. And, and I, their eyes light up and they go, they look at you and what you're doing and they hear Dwayne talk and they see, look around and they go, oh, finally, these are my people. And I'm sure some of you guys have experienced it going, oh, this is, this is a, you know, I go to other conferences and I feel like a fish out of water. I don't even like being there. I come here, this feels like home. Right. And I think, and I, and I think, I think that's what happens. And so they begin to attract those people. So these networks are now attracting those high, what I would call high capacity, zero to one. They can start something, create something from nothing kind of leaders. And so those are the ones that are growing, which is unfortunately or whatever, maybe it's just going to be the cycle. As I think it also encouraging almost or expediting the, demi de the demise of a lot of denominations. And then on top of that, conferences like Exponential come along and now because they're fostering that, but what we do is then, you know, you have a big stage, five, fifth, you know, 5,500 people in a room, 70,000 people online watching, and the people that we platform mm. are people that are planting churches, that are reproducing churches, that are talking about movement. So right. now all of a sudden you have a younger, a younger generation of type, I'll just kind of call it the way I see it, type A leaders who want to be successful in whatever this thing is they're going to do. Right. And instead of it being just the big church, that that's successful, maybe like when we planted, it was like, you want right. to be Bill Hybels, you want to be Rick Warren, let's go grow a big church. 
Now success, I think, is being redefined, and success looks like how do I become, how, how do I not just plant one church, but how do I plant lots, and maybe it's big, but how do I plant lots of churches? Mm. So there's, I think there's a changing definition of success mm, that's, that's attracting a whole different caliber of leaders, which I think is good news for the kingdom. Right. That's really good. I hadn't thought about that. That's, that's true. Because I remember somebody giving me Purpose Driven Church. Yeah. You know, it came out about the same time I was playing my church, mm -hmm. and Rick Warren became the hero. But you're right. I think I hear in the language of a lot of young church planters, they're not just thinking about planting their church. They're thinking, you know, five, ten years down the road, how can I, how can I be a catalyst to plant some other churches in, in, you know, even beyond the city that I believe God's sending me to? How can I raise up some other leaders? And they're thinking, you know, third and fourth generation down Absolutely. the road. And that's a different different it paradigm shift. Well, you, th you think about the whole multi-site movement. I mean, when we first went, when we first went to multiple locations, whatever, it's been 12, 13 years ago now, um, we were a part of, and I don't know if you know the story on this, but we were part, Leadership Network. Are you familiar with, familiar with Leadership yeah. Network? Yeah. Give me, show me a show of hands. You're familiar with the organization Leadership Network? It's yeah. a Dallas-based organization. Basically what they do is they look for innovations in the local church. They grab a hold of those innovations, and then they try to platform them to foster that so it goes across the whole, the whole church nationwide. They're kind of a real behind-the-scenes kind of group, but they do a great job with that. Well, they grabbed uh, a handful of us that had just gone multi-site. In fact, a guy named Lyle Schaller, who used to do all the yeah. homework on all this stuff. He's now well into his 80s, and he's not writing anymore. But at that time, he said there were less than 100 multi-site churches in the United States. Mm. He pull, they pulled us all together. We did this leadership community, and that group was like Seacoast, the churches you've heard that they yeah. would now get platforms. Seacoast, yeah, Greg. Um, Life Church was in there. Uh, North Coast was in there. We were in there. There were a whole bunch of churches like that. They brought us together. We learned from each other, and it really expedited all of our growth. Then we started doing a conference that they actually sponsored across the country. Yeah. And here it is now, you know, 12 years later, and went from less than 100 churches. Now there's more than 8,000 multi-site churches in the United States. Wow. Wow. That's, I mean, that's a, that's a And thing. define multi-site for me. I mean, I know okay. that that seems, sure. but there's lots of different models. Can you just kind of define it? That? It is kind of tricky to define, but basically it's, it's a church that has more than one location. And so, I mean, um, and sometimes, I mean, sometimes they're done by video teaching. A lot of times they're done by in-person teaching. Um, some of them are really closely aligned. Some of them, they just, they just kind of share a name and a vision. But basically, they have one umbrella. They would, and usually, the moniker is kind of, we're one church with multiple locations. Right. One right. church with multiple locations. Do you see that as, as a continuing trend, uh, you know, on, into the future, not only church planning, but multi-site? And, and what I'm really curious to hear in you talk about, because you're not only a student of, of church, but because you're, uh, you're a missional church planner, you're a student of culture, what, what's, what's going to be necessary? What, what's stirring in your crock pot right now <laughs> as you're thinking about churches, church planners, leaders, multi-site movements, as you see all the shifts that are so quickly taking place in culture, you know, the shifts, the gay marriage, the legalization of marijuana, um, technology uh, proliferation, denominations kind of going into a demise. What are the things in the next, you know, short period of time, I'd like to say five years, but it might be three to ten years, what's that going to look like and what are you uh, designing in your heart and thinking about the church needs to look like in order to engage that culture? I mean, that's a big question. Yeah. But are there some things that... Well, there's, uh, I, I, there's, there's some topics. I don't think... I, I'm not sure I have answers. So okay. I, we can go there a little bit and you can, we can push on it and see what, see what happens. Yeah. Um, I th I do, I, the, the LG, do you think multi-site's going to continue to kind of be oh, a, yeah. a part of that? Oh, yeah. yeah. I don't think there's any, I don't, to me, there's no doubt about that. I, I think if you want to go there, I, mean, I think the evolution of multi-site, and we're, ha we're having this happen a lot at, through New Thing, is what you have is you have... Um, you have like, okay, Dave here, right? Dave? Dave's in Chesterton. He's got two years or a thousand, okay, people. So he's now going through this question of, okay, how, do I do new, more, more sites or do I start planting churches? And what we're increasingly finding is that the answer is yes. Mm. To all. All of the above. Yeah. And then what we do, what you do is you begin to provide a track that says um, that rather than you know what, I got a great vision. I want you to come help me with my vision. Mm. What's your name? Paul. Paul. So instead of me going, hey, Paul, I got this great vision for Chicago. I need you to come help me with the vision. Instead, what we do, we go, hey, Paul, what's your dream? How can I help? And if Paul wants to, and if somebody liked that one, huh? <laughs> uh, and so if Paul wants to go plant a church, then I do everything I can to make Paul successful, go plant a church. If Paul wants to be, if he goes like, well, why don't I go plant a church? These guys have figured out a lot of stuff. I, I got the whole infrastructure here. I don't have to worry about finances. And all, I got, no, I want to plant a campus. Okay, let's go plant a campus. That's, I, I feel like, so I think that's, 
That's, I think, more a glimpse of the future where they're going to take, talk about both tracks. And, and then what's also happening is I'm seeing a lot of the larger churches are actually coming to us and saying, hey, can you help us start networks? Hmm. We actually just introduced a new thing, something that's acrostics, LARN, L-A-R-N. It's just leading a reproducing network. We got a, there's a church in Manchester that has a couple thousand with four locations. There's a church in Norway, probably the leading church, one of the leading churches in Norway, incredible church. Um, then there's a group in India and then a, and a few in the United States, and we're kind of piloting with them, and basically we're taking them through a one-year process because they have all these young leaders coming to them and say, hey, we want to learn from we want to learn from you. We don't, and they don't know what to, they're going to like, we want to help them, right, but we don't know how to organize this thing, and we're pretty good at that. And we said, well, let's coach you. We'll spend a year together, and one of the things you do at the end of that you'll be able to actually go ahead and launch a network. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about a network, it, it could be as small as like four or five other churches. Okay. And that becomes the beginning of a network. And I, I think you're going to see a lot of that too mm -hmm. in the future. I don't know if that, that doesn't really answer the culture question, yes. but that's, I think that's, I definitely think that's not in the future. That's in the present right now for, for churches. And that's going to continue oh, I, I think, globally. I think so. And I, th and I think you'll also see, I think it's not going to be an either or. There's going to be a lot more both and thinking. There's gonna, we're going to embrace that there can be lots of small churches that are going to be great. And there's right. also going to be lots of very, even larger churches. I mean, Life Church is now over 65,000 people. Yeah, and, spread out over how many states? Oh, how, yeah. yeah. And, and, I mean, they don't, they don't advertise the number because they think it's actually detrimental to, to their cause. But I think mm -hmm. you're going to see churches that will grow over 100,000, but you're also going to see a lot of micro churches too. So I think you're going to, and I think we ought to embrace both models because I think it depends on the gifting of the people. Okay, so uh, you were talking about apprentices. I want to shift gears kind of okay. into a local church. Uh, cultural context because obviously everything that you've done in New Thing and then in Multisite really started with having a leadership developing culture in a local church. From the, from the beginning, that began to expand and it began to grow. And in your book, you talk about the, the 2 2 2 principle mm -hmm. that you guys use. Uh, I'd love for you to talk on what, what, what is a nuts and bolts leadership developing culture within a local church context like yours, what does that look like in practical day-to-day -day terms? And sometimes it can sound really sexy because it's like, oh, I've got this apprentice and this and this. What are some of the pitfalls that goes with that? Because there's a price tag to shifting to that type of a, that type of a culture too. So maybe just touch on that a little bit. So um, maybe explain your 222 principle, what that looks like and how it plays out. At, I mean, at, the, the, at the 222 principle for us comes straight from 2 Timothy 2.2. Okay, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. And basically you have Paul talking to Timothy, and Paul says to Timothy, Paul is telling him, hey, I'm, I, what I've entrusted to you, I want you to entrust to other reliable people who then will teach others. And so basically, I mean, just by illustration, so you have Paul, then you have Timothy, and then you have other reliable people that then invest in others. And, and I'm not sure I could really exegete this and prove it's exactly right, but I like to think it is. Right. <laughs> if you have Jesus giving us kind of the big vision, in Acts yeah. 1, hey, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. you got Paul coming along as this apostle, and he's going, okay, let's get, I love Jesus' vision, let's, let's get the strategy and tactics. Right. What are the strategy and tactics for pulling it off? And he's talking to Timothy, here's the strategy and tactics. Timothy, what I've invested in you, you invest in other people, and those people are going to invest in others. And once we get to four generations of reproduction, okay, then we're pretty sure we can make Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth happen. Mm. This is the strategy and tactics for how we're going to actually pull off the mission. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. That's really good. And I think, that, I think that's what we're talking about here. Now, um, there's, there's a handful of really, I think, simple tools, and we, we talk about an exponential, really simple tools that, that, um, that you use, I, I think, to, to actually create a leadership development culture. And, I mean, one of them is, um, can I talk about the leadership path? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. yeah please. One of them is what we call a leadership path. And... You heard my, my, my story earlier about Troy, and if, um, there we go. There you go. Basically, I'll kind of illustrate this. You got individual, then I'm going to call this an X is like 10, A stands for apprentice, then you got X is like 10, a leader of 10, okay, just a leader, and then you got, these are all Roman numerals, forgive me for doing this, that's like a coach, this is, I hope this makes sense to everybody. Um, CP, we'll do this. It looks like chemistry class. Yes, it does. <laughs> I'll tell you what, to make sense of this too, so it doesn't just make sense to me, I'll write this in here. This is individual, okay? Great. This is an apprentice. Can you guys all see this? 
This is a leader. Is it large enough to see? Yeah, they can see it. Yeah. Okay, this is a coach. This is a campus pastor or a church planter. I don't care which one. This is what I call a network leader. And this is a, what, we call, what we call a movement leader. Now, what's, what's kind of fun, uh, so two years ago, I'm at Exponential. I'm sitting across the table from a guy named Ray. Ray's this, you can clearly tell, um, young, apostolic, kind of apostolically gifted. I mean, you can tell he's got history of starting something from nothing, growing at large. And I'm able to sit across from him and go like, you know, Ray, I'd love to have you be a part of what community is doing. We have a dream for 200 locations, but I need to know what your dream is. He's like, yeah, that sounds interesting to me. Tell me about it. And I said, well, listen, Ray, here's, 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 a, here's a whole leadership path that we can actually take you on. Hmm. That you would come as a leadership resident, okay, and a leadership resident, would you would apprentice with a, church, with, a, with a campus pastor or a church planner, and we would actually, you'd actually start out just as an individual, and we'd actually have you go ahead, and you'd actually apprentice in a small group. So you'd actually start, because we want you to go through the whole path. You'd, you'd apprentice in a small group. When you think you're ready, remember leader readiness? It's when you think you're ready, and I think you're ready. We both think you're ready, then you're ready, go. Then you go start, and you lead the group. You're going to take along an apprentice, and after you reproduce another group, then you'll start coaching those groups. And then as you coach those groups at the right time, then I can see you moving to be a campus pastor or a church planner. As you take on other leadership residents and you reproduce that, you, you can start your own network. And as you reproduce networks, you can actually become a movement leader. Hmm. Now, I mean, that sounds grandiose, okay? But for people like me, <laughs> when I'm 25, I'm going like, wow, you can help me do that? And for some people, I mean, some people, they're just, they're more interested in how do I get to here or how do I get to here, how do I get to here. But there's some people who are like, no, I can, you can help me do that? Um, John Sosniewski. John's a guy who, uh, he worked for AIG Insurance. He was in our, in our church, a uh, sharp young guy. Actually, he actually found his way back to God at our church, um, was volunteering, volunteering in our kids' ministry, and, um, but then started getting involved in our small groups. He became an apprentice. Uh, he, he quickly moved to becoming a leader of a small group. He reproduced other leaders, started coaching. He actually coached my wife for a while. My wife would say that John's the best coach she's ever had. Wow. Um, he coached. And then at that point in time, he actually approached us and said, you know what? I've seen other people like Troy. I told the story of Troy. Make this move to becoming a campus pastor. He said, if there's any way that I could ever get on staff, I'd be willing to quit my job and do whatever it takes. I'd love to have that conversation with you. We kept that conversation alive. He quit his job. He came on staff as a small groups director. And then he actually came, then he got, became a campus pastor. And then we, at Community, we now have so many campuses, we actually have put them into networks. He became our, one of our first network leaders. And just recently, because we went to 14 and four networks, he became our movement leader. Hmm. So over the course of about 10 years, he left AIG, never went to Bible college, never went to seminary, and he moved through this whole leadership path. And, th and having, having this kind of a thing like this, and you can put it in your own language, you can literally write it on the back of a napkin. I mean, I've done this in Panera with, I mean, I'm thinking of another guy named John who sat me down and goes, man, I love what's going on here. I love what's going on in the community. Um, how can I expand my influence? Now, most of the time when you're talking about the individual, are you waiting for them to come to you? Or are you scoping, you know, the crowd out, always. observing some people, looking for them and, and recruiting them? I'm all, yeah, you're always scoping. You're always looking. Yeah. 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 What kind of things are you looking for that you specifically, you know, over the years, you're kind of like, yeah, this person can be, you know, they can get to a leader uh, component, you know, or I see them could potentially, or maybe you don't. Maybe you're just like, I just, you know, I see the, uh, some level of a leadership gift on them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a conversation with them. There's, I think a few things. Um, I think I, I, I have a tendency to look for people I like. Uh -huh. well, that's, yeah, there you go. <laughs> I avoid people I don't like. So. <laughs> exactly. So you need, to, you need to go start a group at the other church down the road. Because if I'm going to hang out with them at Starbucks every week, and they're going to, I want to be with somebody I like. Right. And so that's that's kind of a that's a pr kind of a priority. Yeah. The other thing I, I I love people that have initiative. Yeah. And so and, and so a lot of times you see some kind of initiative, and so I'm I pretty quickly re respond to that. One of the things I noticed too, and in, in like even in a small group setting, and you can kind of watch this. If you're in a, if you're in a group setting too. Whenever there's like a question being asked or maybe a decision needs to be made, you can kind of watch people's heads and they, turn, they seem to uh -huh. gravitate towards certain people. Yeah. And, and you'll notice there'll be like certain people, like all of a sudden everybody's like going like right to her, you know? And you go, okay, what is it, what is it that just intuitive, everybody's looking for her opinion? Mm -hmm. 
And th- those, those are the kind of things. And there's also, I think, kind of, kind of an intuition. I have to be a little bit careful, though, because I, def- I always look for the entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. I, l- I love the zero to one person. And some of the zero to one people, you know, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff in here, too, that it's, sometimes they get bored with that. Mm-hmm. And, and of course, I, I, want, I want to be surrounded by those people, and, but we need other types, too. So I have to be, you have to temper it a little bit. Okay. Hey, if we can, the guys who have microphones, uh, we're gonna take some questions that you might wanna have on church culture, leadership, church planning, any of those types of things you can ask Dave. So if you have uh, a question that you would like to ask, uh, we're gonna spend a few minutes doing that. So what I guess we'll just do, we're not gonna have it texted in or anything like that, but if you just raise your hand, uh, these guys with the microphones will come and find you and, uh, and give you an opportunity to ask, ask these questions and we got one right over here. Hey, Blake. How you doing, sir? If you had a person, uh, per se, who, if they could rewind uh, the years, eight years back, they would uh, sign up as an apprentice in your organization, um, yet they're already engaged in what is, there, there's no rewinding eight years and moving to Chicago and becoming an apprentice. Um, what would be your recommendation, then, for that person? Are you thinking um, about planting a church, Blake? I, I've already planted a church, so... You just started. How long? How far are you into it? Um, I, you could call it. You could call it eight months. But we we had our first uh, Sunday morning meeting seven weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the first thing I would just emphasize, just for, for the group here too, there is. I, I feel like there is no replacement for doing a leadership residency. That's that, and that's what we a leadership residency is what we call apprenticing alongside another church planner. The particular value we feel like it has with a new thing in community is that is how you get the reproducing DNA. Right. Right. Okay, I'll, and I'll, I'm going to get to your question. Second. Story, a guy named Matt Larson. Matt's a guy out in Thasnos, California. His dad was a pastor. He went and got his MDiv. Super bright guy, good looking, smart, beautiful wife. I mean, everything. The whole, just, you know, it's mm-hmm. obnoxious. All right? He's got it all. <laughs> and so he's going to plant a church, and lots of people are going to love him. Okay, it's just, you know, God gave him that gift. Okay, and it's going to be a big church probably. Yeah. But I, I'm absolutely convinced the game changer for him, though, is that before he planted... He said, okay, even though I got a family and that kind of stuff, I'm going to come and do a residency with you guys for a year. So he comes and does a residency with us for a year. So he goes back to Thousand Oaks to plant his church. And so instead of it just being a great church, like it becomes a large church, he's already in the first four years planted um, two other sites and also a church and had a church plant. And he mm. started with a leadership resident. Wow. So the reproducing culture, you can't get it. And I, and I think that's why I hear Blake going like, okay, I wish I had that, but I don't. So now what do I do? Is it my right? Okay, and I guess my, 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 my encouragement is, um, and I, this is not really a plug for new thing, but you need, but if, I, if it was a plug for new thing, it would sound like this. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and I, I'm not really trying to do it, but I... The views and the remember, opinions. I was also asking about a, another person, not and myself, not remember, yourself. so okay, it's yeah. okay. A friend. A friend. Yeah. Right. A friend, yeah. <laughs> One of the things that we try to do in new thing is, is we, put, we put everybody into a network. And so you're in a network, and basically there'll be four or five other churches, and so you have other peers that are, and everybody in New Thing is filling, we, we call it an MRP, a My Reproducing Plan. Everybody has a, a reproducing plan. Mm. And, and, and you can be, there's a variety of things that you can do, but everybody's doing that. And so first of all, so you're surrounded by peers who are also working through the same stuff, and they're trying to cultivate the same culture, so that's a huge help. But then you also have a network leader who, who has already reproduced. They've reproduced sites or they've reproduced churches or some, somehow they've reproduced and that, that you're connecting with every month. And so I would encourage you, how do you seek out those kind of people, that peers that value the same thing, and how do you find a mentor that's been where you want to go and say, okay, you know what? At this point in the game, I'm not doing a leadership residence, but I, I need to pick up that stuff. How do I get it? Hmm. And, and, and I think if you did that kind of thing with that kind of intentionality, you could totally get it. And... Um, and I think in your, in your new it. thing, Network, kind of touching on his question, if you have somebody who's been on staff at one of your churches, let's say your, you know, one of your campuses yeah. or your, your sites, and they've been there for a period of time, and then they come to you and say, hey, I want to go plant a church, uh, not a campus, but a church, do you still put them through a residency, an intentional residency, or do you consider the fact that they've been on your staff that if they haven't gotten it by now, they're not going to get it? Um, it probably depends on the role that they had on our staff team. Okay. So in some cases, um, if, if, they were like a, if they were a small group director, I mean, they were, they were probably already apprenticing with the campus pastor. Okay. And so in, in that case, if, 
everybody thought they could do it and, and they thought they could do it, we probably wouldn't have them do it because we feel like that was the, right. the informal ap you know, apprenticeship right. residency. And so that would be okay. But other cases we might actually say, no, you know what, let's, let's spend the time. Yeah, I totally agree on the residency thing, by the way. Uh, the churches that we've planted have been either staff people or people that have done an intentional residency. And uh, that's, that's really how RLCI began. It began by uh, Pastor Duane and, and uh, the staff here welcoming me. I remember Paul, you know, you and Colleen came back from Russia and uh, we were able to do a, a residency here and uh, it got on the inside of us. So, you know, we were able to go and plant well. And, and I've seen uh, just a few, but I've seen the churches that the pastors haven't done any level of a residency. You know, they figured, yeah. well, I'm a youth pastor. I've done youth, and uh, so I can do a church on, you know, it's basically a youth group on steroids. I've seen that that sometimes can be problematic if they've not gotten the DNA. Well, and my hunch is, I mean, the reason, part of the reason you have a large church is because you did an apprenticeship with Dwayne. Yeah. And so you, you and, and here's the way, you reproduce who you are. Yeah. And I remember, I remember this, again, I'm going to go back a ways, Lyle Schaller, Lyle's, again, this old guy, and I remember when we got ready to go multi-site, and he said, Dave, one of the things advantage that you have, because we were already seven or 800, he said, you, you are going to, whether you want to or not, you're going to reproduce your large church culture in your other sites. Mm. Mm. And so, which meant there's going to be certain th levels of excellence and certain things you're going to do, right. whether you want to or not, because that's how you already do it. Yeah. And so that's what happens in this, in this apprenticeship leadership residency, whether it has to do with being a large church and that's how you reproduce, or it has to do with being a reproducing church. Yeah. You know, you got, you got to, it's that diatribo, it rubs off on you. And it has a lot to do with he wouldn't let me quit. Uh, he's like, Lee, you are married to that church. <laughs> I tried to quit several times. They just wouldn't let me. Good so advice. I had to succeed. <laughs> I had no choice. <laughs> Questions. If you have a question uh, for Dave, raise your hand. All the way in the back there, I think it's Steve. I'm pointing at you. I think it's Steve. I can't see you, but microphone's coming to you. Yeah, so this thing of reproducing life groups, we structured for that uh, a number of years ago. And uh, so we structured for reproducing life groups a number of years ago with an assistant leader, apprentice built right in, trying to do that. And over a few years, what we found was like, only, it only worked a couple times. And actually it was the same person who was successful a few times because it seemed like people would push back and we want to be in these life-changing discipling relationships. And there's a resistance to breaking out and splitting and starting a new group or have, having a leader go and start a new group. How do you break through that? Yeah, they like each other. <laughs> they don't yeah. want to. How do you break through that? Yeah, you get the question. Yeah, I think I think I got okay. the question. Yeah, that's a great question, and I think it applies at a, at a lot of different levels. I think I'd, I'd say I mean two things come to mind. There's probably it's probably a more sophisticated answer that I'm going to give you, but two things come to mind. One is I think you have to have a commitment that mission will drive everything. Okay, that mission is going to drive everything. That mission is going to provide the answers. Mission is going to provide the next steps. Mission. It's always going to be about the mission, and and for us. At community, we, we talk about helping people find their way back to God. How, how are we going to help more people find their way back to God? Well, you know what? If we all stay in the same group, we're not going to help more people find the God. We've got to do something different. And so, I mean, I think you have to hammer on that over and over and over again. And I think you also, as the leader, you have to model that in multiple ways, including reproducing your own group and that kind of stuff. So that, that's one thing, I think, making sure mission drives everything. But the second thing, I think, is, I think is, a, is the misnomer about groups even about churches and all that kind of stuff, and it goes back to the kind of the second movement maximum that we talked about, is that it's not about size, it's about leader readiness. So I think what you do is you find, a, you find the leader and you give them permission to go, and, and you, only, you only count the yes votes. Mm. Only, the only people that have to go with that other person are people that want to go on this new apostolic, new kind of missional adventure. Okay, so you just send the brand new, just send that apprentice leader out or, or the existing leader out, either one. You don't have, you, quite frankly, and I, we never talk about splitting because splitting is kind of a bad word in the church. Yeah, and so we don't talk true. about splitting groups either. So, I mean, like your whole group could stay intact for, I mean, 10 years mm -hmm. as long as you're constantly saying, okay, let's find one more person that we can cultivate who we're going to send them out. Mm -hmm. Who's one more person that we can cultivate send out? And I think that's, I think I, that's really something that's hurt. You know, lots that happens with missional communities and small groups is the idea of, oh, well, we don't want to split, and so they just stay as a holy huddle. No, we're not talking about splitting. We're, we're talking about having an apostolic impulse, a New Testament church. That's what we're right. talking about, where you're acknowledging there's certain people who have a call in their life, and you're blessing them, and you're saying, go. And we're, we're going to be intentional about that. Yeah. And, that kinda, and some of it, too, goes back to even the Ephesians 4, Apest stuff. Are you yeah. guys in, in that conversation? 
um, you know, where it talks about apostles, prophets, evangelists, yeah, shepherds, totally. and teachers. And it looks to me that when Paul's given those instructions, he's not talking to the big church exclusively, like there's going to be apostles and prophets, evangelists, and shepherds, and teachers. No, he's talking to, no matter how you break up the church, even into a small group, there's going, to be a, there's going to be an apostolic kind of leader. There's going to be prophetic voices. There's going to be someone who has the gift of evangelism and bringing people in and someone else who's going to care more about the people, the shepherd, than, than the apostle does. And so who are those apostolic kind of people that want to go start something brand new? Or the evangelistic person wants to go out and, 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 and share this with other people. And so give them permission to do the thing they're already inclined to do. But don't, don't split the group. Don't so split the group. scenario, let's say you've got a group of 10 people. Yeah. They've been in a group, community. They love it. They, they attend uh, Steve and Doug's church. Yep. Uh, and they're being encouraged, hey, mission, 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 we need to do that. We don't want to, would you, as a leader of that group, would you then import, bring a leader in to, to, uh, into the, the community already, into your little group, and say, all right, I'm, this guy's going to be an apprentice with me. I'm bringing him in. If I don't have an apprentice within this group, can you bring one in and train him and then send them back out? Or does it just kind of come to a standstill? I would probably, I mean, two things. I want to create a culture, okay, like what we heard with Doug and Brad. I want to create a culture where it's not the exception that there's an apprentice, that it's actually the norm and the expectation, first of okay. all. Yeah. And then second of all, if they didn't want to, if they didn't want to comply with that, I'm always, I want, I want to, I want to move. It's kind of a Drucker principle. I want to, I want to, I want to invest in islands of health. I'm not, if, if they don't want to get on board, okay. Because what's what, my experience? Right. Within two years, you're going to die anyway. Mm. So okay, go ahead, die. And I, but I want. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, I mean, at some point, but I, but I do, but I think it's important that I create a culture, though. That's the norm, and yeah. you know, and kind of, I want, I want to move with the people that are moving and count the yes votes. And I'm, ass, I'm assuming in your church context, you're celebrating that all the time. All the time, yeah, we, that's we huge. do. So we, that's a, that's a good thing. We, we, we do a monthly leadership community. Once a month, we bring all our leaders together, of our kids' city leaders, our student community leaders, our small group leaders, our arts leaders. And those are almost all broken into groups of 10, okay? We bring them together. And one of the fun things that we, and we've been doing this for, I mean, since we started. And we do this, it's, it's kind of like a giant Amway rally. Amway, it probably works, that illustration <laughs> yeah, works here. Yeah, yeah. It's like a giant Amway pep rally is what yeah. it's kind of like. And, um, they, uh, and we do this new leader song. So one of our, our band gets up and they take some 80s or 90s tune. They change the words. They have yeah. fun with it. And we basically acknowledge all the brand new leaders. They get to stand up, and we're clapping for them. I mean, so every way we can, we're making heroes out of brand new leaders and mm -hmm. reinforcing that's the place, that's the people we want to be. That's the win. That's the oh, win. that's so totally the win. Everybody in the church is seeing Ab that, yeah. Right. That's exactly right. All right, questions uh, right over here. Yes. Uh, assuming that you have this uh, DNA in you, when you were first starting, Dave, what were the mistakes that you made, and, and what did you gain from the experiences of your mistakes that you could share with us? Mistakes in regards to what? As you're building this leadership pathway, because, I mean, you, you obviously had that DNA in the beginning, but how did, when it un unfolded in you and you started walking out the process, what were the mistakes that you made that you would advise any of us to kind of avoid this? Uh, do you have any wisdom for us yeah, along those lines? Developing leaders, you know, pipeline in the church. Yeah, how did you come up with that? Trial and uh, error. How do we come up with that? Yeah. Here's a little bit of the backstory. There, there, I mean, Cause, cause, yeah. Can I just insert sure. here? Because a, a lot of people, and probably almost every church that's ever tried small groups, yeah. realizes pretty quickly that they can get messy as well. And all of a sudden you got some guy who, I'm a bishop of Uganda, and I need to start my own missional uh, church down the road, and I'm done with you, and you got splits and ugly. And so how do you avoid that? Can you? Um, or, it's, it, or other mistakes. Yeah, I don't. I, don't, I guess I'm not. Sh I'm not. I don't. I'm not sure how. To, that's a good question. I have to figure out how to avoid because we haven't had like that. Okay. And and I know sometimes when you say small groups, there's a different kind of group than maybe what we do. At, mm -hmm. at like a community, um, our small groups, all of them are open. They're all evangelistic, um, and they're also reproducing. And so, it, it, so it's not just like everybody gets together for a Bible okay. study. And in, in the last four years, now they all also have a mission. We could talk about that. Um, the mistakes that you... Okay, mistakes. If you mistakes. had any. Yeah, you're no, saying, no, no, no. You're saying you didn't make any mistakes, and that's why you're the conference speaker. <laughs> <laughs> the... <laughs> Here, here's, I, I, we, we've, I mean, there's lots of mistakes. We talk about campuses we started that didn't, that didn't make it, that we've had to close, because we've, we've had mistakes, big mistakes like that, um, lots of stuff like that. 
How about putting, how about putting uh, leaders in place too quickly? There's people that, that we have done that, but here's the, I guess, gosh, this is going to sound bad. That's all right. Dude. All right, but here's what happens. You don't have with, any more with, sessions, so if you blow with, it, it's with this, With this process, though, with this process, the only way you get to move to the next level, and it's not that it's foolproof at all, but the only way you get to move to the next level is by proving your faithfulness down here. Oh, so yeah. part of the reason it doesn't feel like we had a lot of leader mistakes is because, like, if we put somebody here mm -hmm. and they sucked as a leader, yeah. then nobody goes to their group. And Ooh. the group dies. And, and I don't remember it. <laughs> so when you ask me the question, I'm going like, oh, I don't remember that. <laughs> right. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so the, you have to actually prove your faithfulness all along the way. So in this process, okay, the, the mistakes that we made, the mistakes are made when we, when we supersede the process and we take somebody here and we put them here. Yeah, yeah. That's the, that, those are the mistakes that we made. And then, then all of a sudden, instead, it costs you like 50 people. And, 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 and it's a bad experience for a lot of people. One of the things my brother John, who talks on this quite a bit too, he talks about small groups being a great laboratory for leaders because it's a, it's a place where you can take lots of risk and there's not, and there's not huge, huge losses. Mm, that's good. And so when you ask about the mistakes in the leadership process, it's, it's not that there's been huge losses of that because most of the people have had to go through this, this whole process. Here, here's one thing that's currently going on is actually there's another role right here, kind of small group director that we've identified, most all of our campus pastors be, were once small group directors. We've kind of moved to where we start in like some smaller locations, and some of those smaller locations now, the campus pastor is also the small group director, and so we kind of effectively eliminated a step, mm. and it's really hurt our pipeline. Wow. So, I mean, I would make sure that these are all steps that everybody can take, and make sure you have all the steps, because if yeah. you don't have all the steps, then it'll hurt the pipeline down the end. And I guess maybe the second mistake is make sure you don't promote somebody Too without soon. going through the, all those things. That, that's the, that'd be the second mistake we made. I hear you saying that that apprentice role in campus, church planning, and even small group is pivotal. Oh, so yeah. So if we're too quick to just, you know, you know throw, the, throw the net out, hey, we need a bunch of small group leaders, and you just put them into that leadership role, skipping that apprentice role, that can be terrible. Can and, be if you, and if you skip this, they, they will never have the experience of being an apprentice, so they won't know how to, how to, how to apprentice someone else, so they won't ever reproduce. Yeah, that's good. That's really Is that, good. Was that helpful there? Question over here. Uh, there's been a lot of successful strategies that you've presented, a lot of successful models that you've presented. What has been the uh, successful budgeting strategy and models that you guys have used when multiplying churches? Well, that's a good question for like campuses and stuff. Do you have one? <laughs> yeah, so we screwed this up. Um, <laughs> and I mean, I, my, I, we were talking about this a little bit earlier. I'm, um, I grew up in the home with a pat, with a, as, a, as a pastor's kid, so we never had any money. I don't even, you know, I don't even think about money, really. As long as I got enough to go buy pizza, I'm good, right? Um, and so probably for, I mean, up until probably four or five years ago, even though we were already a pretty large church then, we would literally, we literally well, maybe five or six years ago, we, it was literally week to week. Hmm. And then, you know, you have a couple downturns, and all of a sudden you're going, okay, we can't do that anymore. So the guy I mentioned before, Doug, the Doug who was my apprentice. Do you remember me telling this story, Doug's my apprentice? Well, now he's on staff. He's actually on our lead team now. And he's got a, he's got a real numbers He's, mm. he's great. So he's, been, he's dietary, but he's rubbed off on me, and I'm going, okay, we got a, a bigger ship, and if this thing goes under, we're in big trouble. So here's, here's the model that we're using now. Um, and I, I, don't, I think this... And we call it 10 20 70. And, um, and, and this, is, this, is, this specifically applies to our multi-site setting. Okay. And so what we, what we do is with every campus... We ask them, we say, okay, we want 10% of everything that comes in to go into a multiplier fund. Okay. 10% goes into multiplying, and basically all those dollars get spent on, on basically one of three things, either um, helping fund leadership residence scholarships, uh, planning new campuses, or planning new churches. It's our multiplier fund. And so, I mean, that, we're kind of, we're just, we're, it's like you guys, we're just focused on that. That's our thing. The 20% goes to the center, and it's for our, what we call our creative catalyst, all our creative content, all our, you know, the teaching, the videos, all our curriculum for adults, students, and kids, the creative side. And then also um, central services, which is basically, you know, all your financing, all your web, all your HR, all that other stuff, okay, that, like the business side of it. And then oversight, that's 20%. And then you live on 70. Mm. And when we finally 
settled in on this, it's been like a brand new day. And we've been doing this probably the last four or five years. And what's awesome now, okay, this is why I need some people to help me with this stuff. Because I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good about the leadership development stuff. I wasn't as good about this, so I needed some help. So now, okay, so you got a six, so we have like a six or seven million dollar budget, right? So let's say you got seven million bucks. And next year is the first year we're going to do this. So we're going to have like $700,000 that we can put into church planning. So we're talking about like nine new campuses in the next six years. And then also not only that, but we're talking about launching not just a network, but another movement. I mean, this has been a, it's, it's I remember when, uh, when Doug showed up in the auditorium with the spreadsheet showing me the 10, 20, 70 and how much, and how much money we'd have to put into church planning. It's, I, I'm not even jokingly. It's the only time in my life that I remember looking at a spreadsheet and I felt emotional. I mean, I, I felt like I was getting tears welling up my eyes. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I was like, you're kidding me. It was kind of, I mean, really, it was like I was looking and going like, because I knew I could get the leaders, at least yeah. I think I can, but I'm going like, golly, now we're going to have the money to do this too. And uh, so this has, been a, this has been really helpful to us. Can I add one caveat? Absolutely. One of the things that we did do, because we also want to plan in under-resourced communities. Right? Hmm. So for your resource communities, this is, this is easy. They should be able to do this. In your under-resourced communities, it's, it's more challenging to get there. And I don't want to let them off the hook. So what we've done is in, a, in our campuses that we start in, in, in more economically challenged communities, we cluster them in the same network, kind of like microfinancing, in the same network with two other resourced campuses. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so we tell them, so we want every campus to be at 10, 20, 70, but... They absolutely have to be, or you have to figure out some other way, every network. Every network has to get to that number. So if the more resourced campuses want to say, hey, you know what, we got some more we can chip in while you're still getting there to the under-resourced uh, locations, then we allow that because we, we want to keep starting in under-resourced communities too. Mm, that's really Does good. Does that make sense? So anyway, that, this has been, I didn't, I didn't think of it, but it's been a huge, huge, huge help for us. That's really good. One more question. Dave, question yeah. if, if with your church, so I understand you had breakouts with your small groups and, and I'm following, as a matter of fact, I have your book, Exponential. Um, the, if you have these, your celebration services, do you have membership classes and some of those other components and then people are required to, to uh, get in a small group, et cetera, so forth and so on? Can you kind of elaborate on, on kind of the, the big picture? Um, sure. W one of the things we do, um, we don't have membership, and so we don't have a membership class. And the way you belong is by becoming what we call, a th we call it a 3C Christ follower. So you're a community Christian church, and we want every person to be a 3C Christ follower. So if you're at community, the two things you'd probably consistently hear as a person who just shows up on the weekend, okay, would be, number one, we're all about helping people find their way back to God. That's our mission. And then number two, we want you to celebrate that's your relationship between you and God. And we come here every week to celebrate what God's doing in you and doing in us. We want you to do that. We want you to connect. We want you to do life the way God meant in Acts 2. Do life with other believers in the context of a small groups. Because as we do that, we can get each other through anything. Anything life brings you. If you've got a group of people like that and the church backing you, we can get you through it. That's the second thing, connecting. And then third thing, contributing. There's a specific dream that God has for your life. There's something really important he meant for you to do. And we want you to contribute to the mission. And so we ask every person to be a 3C Christ follower. And if you decide not to be a 3C Christ follower, then you don't belong. If you do decide to become, then you're a part of us. And uh, so that's kind of the way it works. Wow. Can we give a great big thank you to Dave Ferguson? Thanks, thank Dave. You. Yeah. Thanks a lot, man. It was fun. Sure. That was great. It's fantastic. That's thank that you. website he said they'd put up there. Oh, okay. If, this is the right website. Leadnet.org, if they can put that website up there. That was the uh, uh, Leadership Network. We mentioned Leadership Network. Yeah. If you wanted to check it out. One of the things, too, because we, we did some conversation about multi-site, they have uh, probably the best researches out there, and a lot of it's, most of it's free even, mm -hmm. on uh, what's going on in the multi-site world. And they just came out with a brand new study talking about how there's now 8,000 churches. So if you want to check that out, you can. Leadnet.org. It's a great organization. Uh, they've got a lot of resources, exactly what he was just saying, uh, both on that and multi-site churches and a lot of other things like that, too.